participants are and record it. We are now recording just to let everyone know. Um, so should you want to show your face or just um, your screen name or an image just to let you all know. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to join us to this fourth panel called Environments and Communities. And I am Dr. Sochul Chavez in the Department of Music, along with my co-host, depending on where you are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jorge Leal uh, from the History Department. He, him, él, my pronouns. Before we get started, I want to make sure that we do a land acknowledgement um, before we begin our session. So please allow me just to read our land acknowledgement from UCR. In the spirit of Rupert and Jeanette Costo, founding relationship to our campus, we would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, the Cahuilla, Tangva and Luiseño and the Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. To begin with our first presentation, um, I would like to introduce our first presenter, um, Grecia Perez, who is in the Department of Anthropology and who also has an emphasis in Latinx and Latin American studies. The title of her um, presentation today will be Blackness Flowing Down the River in Mexico's Costa Rica a Costa Chica region. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And it's great to be here. Um, can people see the screen with the PowerPoint? OK, perfect. Uh, OK, so today I'm presenting a bit about my project, and it is a works in progress works in progress. Uh, so the title currently is, um, I'm not very sure about it, but I decided on anti-blackness flowing down the Rio Verde. My dissertation project explores citizenship and anti-blackness in the context of environmental racism and environmental justice. Such frameworks are used to unpack the impacts of climate change, mega project development, and green capitalism. Specifically, I ask how an international focus on indigenous exclusion and human rights overlooks the marginalization of black rural residents in the home to a majority of Mexico's black population. Such exclusion allows state led development projects greater leeway to overlook black communities, black communities circumstances and concerns. In noting the overlooked impacts my research seeks to understand one. What environmental changes have occurred near the Rio Verde and Chacagua Lagoons and how have state and international institutions addressed these impacts? Second, what constitutes the productive and viable, a productive and viable environmental development project in a black village versus a mestizo village? And third, how is anti-blackness embedded in hydraulic relationships? In today's presentation, I will focus on this third question which I recognize as anti-Blackness flowing down the Rio Verde and anti-Blackness embedded in hydraulic relations. My presentation will be divided into three sections. I will first describe the setting and the issues analyzed. Second, I will explain methods and share some insight to key findings. And finally, I will end with a suggested framework to understand Blackness in Mexico. The map on the top left corner shows that the Costa Chica region is in the Pacific coast of the states of Guerrero and Oaxaca. The map on the right zooms in on the communities in coastal Oaxaca, communities that I learned from and collaborate with. The three triangles represent the three villages discussed today, El Azufre, Charco Redondo, and Paso de la Reina. In 2007, the Mexican government proposed building a hydroelectric dam on the Rio Verde, a large waterway that runs from the highland mountainous region in the state of Oaxaca down to the Pacific coast. The dam was proposed to be built near the coastal highland village of Paso de la Reina. In response, the mestizo residents of Paso de la Reina formed a collective social movement, COPUDEVER, which stands for Consejo de Pueblos Unidos por la Defensa del Rio Verde. COPUDEVER's purpose is to resist the building of the mega project and protect the Rio Verde, and is described as a movement involving Mixteco, Chatino, Afro-Oaxacan, and Mestizo people impacted by the proposed dam. 
Through ethno ethnographic field research, I have learned that Copudever does not address the agriculture runoff and the drastic climate change impact on wetlands and the river, nor the, nor the surveillance from conservation programs that black villages face downstream. A few kilometers downstream between the Rio Verde estuary and the Pacific Ocean sits the village of El Azufre, a black community with the lowest income levels in the region and even fewer economic opportunities. El Azufre is located within the border of Lagunas de Chacagua National Park is already, and is already impacted by an irrigation dam established in 1992. It is now further ecologically and economically threatened by the proposed hydroelectric dam of Paso de la Reina. Charco Redondo is another black community that is located between El Azufre and the irrigation dam. These two communities have particular and similar experiences they mostly share, and they mostly share the impact influencing change in the landscapes and waterscapes. Um, so just briefly, I will point to where the irrigation dam is. It's here in this body of water where my arrow is um, circling, and this is Charco Redondo and El Azufre and Paso de la Reinas up here. And the proposed dam was to be built a few kilometers upstream from Paso de la Reina. I will present findings from two different forms of ethnographic methods, semi-structured interviews and participatory mapping. In 2015, I conducted semi-structured interviews with residents of Paso de la Reina and members of Copudevet, a methodological approach to learning more about the relationship between civil society and the state. When applying similar methods in El Azufre or Charco Redondo, I learned that Black communities expressed additional concerns that seemed more urgent and clearly connected to the changing landscapes. In recognizing that Black people's concerns are absent in the movement of Copudevet, I improvised a different method participatory mapping as a way to travel by walking on land or boat riding in the river and ocean to, to learn directly from the people how they see places, how places and practices matter to them and how their being may be connected to the landscapes and waterscapes. Today, I will briefly talk about these three excerpts from different interviews and participatory mapping experiences. In 2015, after meeting with the Comuneros from Paso de la Reina, they granted me permission to stay in Paso de la Reina and conduct ethnographic fieldwork, including interviewing residents and members of Copudevet. I conducted semi-structured interviews that included the open-ended question, why are you opposing the construction of a hydroelectric dam? The general consensus was that this dam would harm and interrupt the ecosystems that the community of Paso de la Reina depends on for farming, fishing, and cattle ranching. One resident in providing an example of why dams are bad for the community stated that the current irrigation dam downriver prevents a fish called el endoco from swimming upriver. The endoco is similar to a lobster and the Copudeva member argued that examples like these would occur at a larger, or at a larger scale. After conducting data analysis, I realized el endoco, the fish, was the only way members of Copudever made direct connections with their downstream black neighbors. A, se a second example uh, is participatory mapping with Lucila. Lucila is a resident of Charco Redondo. I spend a lot of time with her. Um, we often cook, we walk around, but specifically, this practice, we walked to the Rio Verde where Lucila shared multiple uses not discussed today. But Lucila's insight and her attention to the irrigation dam was what prompted me to continue working with and learning from people in El Azufre and Charco Redondo. For people in Charco Redondo, the redirection of water from the Rio Verde to the large scale agriculture farms produces serious impact to the wetlands used for growing crops. The wetlands, which are locally referred to as Tierras de Chahue, do not require any formal irrigation technology. Their proximity to the Rio Verde allows the dirt to reach a humid point where seed germination is possible during the rainy season. Such changes happening today threaten successful farming seasons and produce pressure to spend money on irrigation technology. My second example of participatory mapping is riding on a small boat called Apanga with Felix along the, Rio Verde, Re, along the Rio Verde. Felix had previously taken biologists studying the flora and fauna of the river and he assumed this was a similar excursion. During our ride, I asked Felix, what happens when there is no fish to catch? 
as he was telling me that the irrigation dam rerouting the water also impacts the fishing practices. Here, I will share a short soundscape, soundscape of the moment, but I will actually share with you on the chat the link to my SoundCloud so you can listen to it because it doesn't sound that great when I share from my screen. But basically I asked, um, you know, I asked Felix as a fisherman from El Azufre, what would you say is needed? Felix said, oh, you need so much, so many things, but they are not available. And I said, I responded, what do people do to prepare for the season when fish are scarce? Felix, well, here we suffer since it is called El Azufre here, we are suffering. Sometimes we tie a knot in our stomachs, we sleep upside down on our stomach and we make it through one day. Now I will explain how I see environmental racism and environmental justice as different frameworks. Environmental racism refers to environmental policies, practices, or directives that disproportionately disadvantage individuals, groups, or communities based on race and, or color. Robert Bullard argues that environmentalism lacks a race and class analysis, and that often victories that may sound progressive overlook, overlook and harm vulnerable groups. An example such as this one is occurring in El Azufre, which is also inside the Mexican National Park managed by Mexico's environmental ministry, Semarnat. Semarnat leads with the discourse of environmentalism and sustainability, and they present conservation programs as solutions for Black communities struggling to make ends meet and suffering from changing landscapes and waterscapes. Environmental justice, as defined by Ingrid Waldron, are, quote, strategies for addressing the condition or problem of disproportionality and envisions what is achievable when the condition is treated through a variety of targeted policies, end quote. So the end goal would be to be part of an environmental justice framework. Boundary making is fundamental to my proposed framework. The embodiment of boundary making is also what has led me to do this work. I understand boundary making as physical on a geographical map and also psychological and placed on perceptions of the body. Tryon Woods argues that gratuitous violence is punishment for simply existing as such. And in this way, it serves as primary boundary between those bodies whose humanity is taken for granted and those bodies that signify humanity's absence. Within environmental racism frameworks, I witness boundary making and how spatialization of structured positions of being black informs the separation and containment of black people in El Azufre and Charco Redondo. While I recognize that constitutional recognition of black people in a recent is a recent phenomenon in Mexico, resulting in the Mexican census, now including a category for African descendants, Research and scholarship on Black Mexico and the conditions surrounding Blackness in the country are still quite limited. There's a handful of scholars whose ethnographies engage with Mexicans on how they identify. The results show that often people deny accepting being Negro, being Black, and typically within that refusal, there is a claiming to a Black ancestor. In engaging with this literature, I find it important to think of citizenship as relationships between Black and non-Black people but thinking of the category of the Black and the non-Black as structured positions of being. I draw from Wilderson III Jr. to think about the category of the Black, the Mestizo, and the Indio as structured positions of being. In examining the underwriting of grammar of suffering, Wilderson argues, quote, the savage, the human, and the slave should be theorized in the way we theorize the worker and the capitalist as positions first and identity second or as we theorize capitalism as a paradigm rather than as an experience. That is before they take on national origin or gender specificity, end quote. I draw from this framework to analyze the grammar of suffering within the discourse of human rights happening in the Costa Chica region. I utilize my ethno ethnographic research to present different narratives coming from the mestizo and from the black in order to interrogate the, communic the communicability of the worries and the concerns as legitimate forms of suffering. 
I measure communicability through the capacity to fit the narrative of suffering into a framework of environmental justice, especially one that departs from environmental racism by communicating its current state of environmental injustice. In thinking about the differences between justice and injustice, I think of what Hartman and Wilderson call gratuitous violence and question whether the refusal to recognize the suffering Black people face in Charco Redondo and in El Azufre can be better understood through fungibility and accumulation rather than alienation and exploitation. Black people suffering in the region becomes normalized, excused, and ultimately denied as important or relevant. From personal communication with Mexican biologists, it becomes apparent that there is a level of equal authority that legitimizes ignoring and denying importance of specific worries to a changing landscape and waterscape in the lower parts of the Rio Verde. When a biologist in, in my Mexican Fulbright interview offered the following critique, quote, not sure why you are studying Black people when they are a minority in Mexico. Here we have more indigenous communities which you do not look at at all, end quote. It became apparent more than ever that the structure of the entire, war, of the entire world is indeed suttered by anti-Black solidarity. Thank you, that's all I have. Muchisimas gracias, well done. Thank you, Grecia. Thank you, Grecia. Um, up next, we, we do have Alain Malfavon from the History Department, recent graduate uh, of the History Department. He will be um, giving us his uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lea, for the introduction. And thank you to Dr. Aguirre, Dr. Chavez, Dr. Felix for the opportunity and to the Center for Ideas and Society. Just bear with me one second and please let me know if you can see my screen right here. I'm just going to share presentation. Perfect. Well, good afternoon to everyone. And also, I forgot to mention Grecia, excellent presentation. I'm so interested in your research. I um, would like to talk to you all about today about, a bit about my dissertation, King of the Lower Port, Afro-Mexicans in Veracruz in the Making of State Formation, Contested Spaces, and Regional Development. And to take you on a journey through the late colonial and early 19th century of Mexico and the roles of Afro-descendants in the port city of Veracruz and the region of Veracruz in the formation of modern Mexico. But I would like to open my presentation today, actually, by sharing a story that I found in one of my many rich and complex archival sources used in my dissertation. The year was 1826, the day December 24th, Christmas Eve. A newly independent port city of Veracruz, part of a recently formed Mexican Republic, celebrated the one year anniversary of the expulsion of the last remnant of Spanish military presence in Mexico from the Al Fortress of San Juan de Lua a year prior in 1825. A local elite man by the name of Tomás Pastoriza, whose background is ignored by the historical record, but we can assume he was part of the, spa of the small Spanish merchant and bureaucrat class of the port city, proceeded to make a nationalistic and symbolic speech that alluded to Mexico's independence as he presided over the symbolic manumission of two African slaves on the stage. And his speech, he mentioned, and I quote, now restituted, the sweet calm of peace, we now occupy ourselves alone in the fulfilling of our respective duties. And today, dedicated to celebrate the first anniversary of the surrendering of Ulua, what better offering could we offer in such a plausible moment than that of redeeming these two Africans that live under the hard yoke of slavery? I tenderly witnessed this singular display. Similar to us, they were born free, and only a nefarious principle so inveterate in the practice of some nations can perpetuate the unjust commerce of beings whom nature conceded the same prerogative as all of us. Live in peace, all so fortunate mortals. You are now free on the same day that we remember the day in which we became free from Spanish tyranny. Now, despite benign associations of freedom and liberty, Pastoriza's speech failed to identify even the names of the two enslaved Africans who were being liberated. Nor was there any mention of the local troops and militias, the great majority of them of African descent, who not only manned both sides of the original Mexican struggle for independence, but also who supported the first calls across all of Mexico in Veracruz for Mexico to become a federal republic, as, at the same time as they defended the region from entrenched Spanish aggression. What Pastoriza's speech ultimately did show was an entrenched and evident intent to consider slavery, the Spanish, and above all, blackness on becoming of Mexico and the Mexican character. 
even as slavery continued to exist in Mexico until 1829. As such, this amazing story I just shared with you all shares three important aspects of my work. First, there are black people present in the history and the stories of Mexican independence, and they're not a small or insignificant part of the story, but a big one. Second, Afro-descendants are connected to much larger movements of revolution, violence, and resistance. And third, this is a story that invites us to rethink how the archive both includes and silences black experiences at the same time as it creates a Mexican experience that subverts any experience rooted on blackness in Mexico. Before I proceed, I wanted to share a bit of the aspects of my work, the basics of it. And I think one of the most important aspects of my work is one that shows how for descendants in Veracruz created black spaces, contested and redefined these spaces and how the state ultimately responded to this. My work both thinks how to narrate black experience while at the same time contends with the archival limitations of such a narrative creation. I must also stress that at its core, my work is a project that examines the history of the African diaspora in Mexico. My work situates peoples of African descent as essential political and intellectual actors that contest traditional narratives of state formation in Veracruz and Mexico during the age of revolutions to connect the colonial period with the early independent period of Mexico and Latin America through the eyes and agency of black experience, something that hasn't really been done for the history of studies of the history of Mexico before. And now to answer the question uh, probably on everybody's mind, right? Why Veracruz? Well, the port city of Veracruz was for the entire 300 year long period of the Spanish colonial presence in Mexico, 1521-1821, the only significant nexus of trade, maritime transportation and communication between colonial Mexico and Spain. This was colonial Mexico's and later on early independent Mexico's port by excellence. But nevertheless, Black experience dates back to the earliest Spanish presence in Mexico and in the mainland of the continent, as it goes hand in hand with establishment of conquest and Spanish colonialism and with the founding of Veracruz in 1519 by Spanish conquistadores. Amongst them, Juan Garrido, a black conquistador, see here represented in the Codex Azcatitlán, meeting Aztec Emperor Moctezuma alongside Hernán Cortés. Now, peoples of African descent in Veracruz became pillars of regional economic development, especially after a massive arrival of enslaved Africans through the port city of Veracruz by the late 16th century with the aim to replace the dying off indigenous population due to the um, genocide of smallpox brought about by Europeans to Mexico. The increased numbers in Veracruz and in colonial Mexico actually gave rise by 1650 to the largest enslaved population in the Americas, second only to Brazil. But it wasn't just enslaved Africans who became instrumental for economic development. As enslaved and free African men actually outnumbered African women two to one, this led to increased racial intermixing with the scant indigenous populations of the region and occasionally with Europeans, giving rise to multiple castas or mixed, racially mixed peoples as they were dubbed in the colonial era. Peoples, mixed peoples of African descent that at birth were free, such as the pardos and the mulatos. Now, by the late 18th century, it was actually free for descendants who became the region's largest demographic sector. Just to give you a sense, allow me to share a bit of the demographic numbers of the 1791 and 1799 census. In 1791, 33% of the population inside the walls of the port city was of African descent. And out of 4,000 inhabitants, 1,335 individuals were living inside the wall perimeter. Eight years later, 1799, 73% of the city's hinterland, 73% was of African descent. With a dominant population, peoples of African descent found significant roles in regional economy and society, as they created and established black spaces that reflected even in the names of some Afro-descendant towns in the hinterland, which made reference to African regions, ethnic groups, languages, communities, points of origin. Amongst them, towns such as Mandinga, Mosomboa, Mocambo, Mozambique, just to name a few. Some of them were even recognized by Spanish authorities as legal towns in colonial mapping, as we see in this portion of a 1793 map delineating the existence and the presence geographically of the town of Mandinga, south of the port city, a town that to this day still lives on in Veracruz. Part of my work invites us to reread archival sources in order to reconsider narratives of regional and state formation. For patterns of black space are present in the record, but we haven't yet truly seen them. 
also by the late 18th century, being a sizable regional population, Afro-descendants not only made their own spaces, but actually took sizable portions of the colonial structures. And one of them was the Spanish colonial militia. Now, the Spanish colonial militia was by the 1770s, an institution that was virtually present everywhere in Spanish America. And it actually made of late colonial Veracruz and Mexico to have similarities socially and politically with places such as Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, and Cuba, for example. In these contested spaces, such as Veracruz, the militias needed the full participation of Afro-descendants of alterns, who in turn actually obtained active roles in the militia and benefits such as tax exemption and fuero. Fuero was basically the right for military personnel to be judged only through military courts and military judges, avoiding civil law and civil authorities. And Veracruz became the only place by the late 18th century, early 19th century in all of colonial Mexico that had black officers for the both companies of the black militias, just giving a sense to you all of the importance of the black presence and black agency politically in Veracruz at the time. But black space making, and I call it attorney black spaces, also were created, particularly and exemplary to the act of Marunash, right? Marunash, the method of social political resistance implemented by former slaves who run away and become Maroons and establish their own communities. This was a method that thrived very much in Veracruz. And I have to clarify, this is not a method that was sold in Veracruz, it's replicated across the Caribbean and Brazil, but it's one that connects Veracruz and Mexico to the greater Caribbean and the greater African diaspora world in the Americas. Examples of Marunash in Veracruz date as early back as 1609 with the rebellion of Gaspar Yanga that led actually to the foundation of the first free black town in the entire mainland of the American continent, San Lorenzo de los Negros by 1619. It continues to the late 18th century with the Maroons of the town of Amapa, founded in 1769 and recognized as a legal town in this piece of cartography by the Spanish colonial state. But the existence of these spaces did not die off in the 18th century. It actually evolved, as I argue in my dissertation, by the 19th century. And I think that evolution and that connection, that greater connection of the African diaspora and the Atlantic world with Veracruz through black experience is represented best by an 1805 slave rebellion near the plantation of El Potrero, across, near the city of Córdoba, Veracruz, in the mountainous highlands, England of the current, current state of Veracruz. But what makes the story of El Potrero so unique is that it demonstrates the ripples and effect of the intellectual currents that the Haitian Revolution had by 1804 across the Atlantic world, and especially over free and enslaved Afro-descendants in Veracruz. And I want to share with you all in this slide, uh, uh, actually a piece of the work of, that I translated, and I did a lot of translation over this 150 petition written by the Maroons themselves, who were actually literate and who actually very wisely chose to remain anonymous, petitioning the Viceroy for mercy and pardon through the use of an excellently crafted language of suffering and innocence that appealed to the Spanish cultural sensibilities. And by that, I mean deep Catholic religiosity. And it's evident in this opening sample statement, a petition that I would like to translate for you all. And I read as I translate and I quote, we ask your excellency that by the blood of Christ, you read this entire paper. It is in this document that these Maroons on the run cleverly excuse their complex coordination in organizing a regional rebellion of over 500 slaves from across three plantations of the region that engage the Spanish through armed resistance, take over of plantations and sugar mills across the, the Potrero lands. The Maroons justify the rebellion as resulting from the unjust violence and weepings from the master, especially over women and children. But if a carefully crafted written petition written by literate Maroons was not impressive enough, in a show of their heightened intellectual and political knowledge of developments across the Atlantic world, the Maroons actually petitioned in this document to the Viceroy directly, the immediate restitution of the 1789 Spanish Black Code, an empire uh, trans-imperial uh, code for the better treatment of slaves for masters and colonial authorities, which not surprisingly, had been outlawed in 1791 as the Haitian Revolution had started. The 1805 rebellion shows the intersectionality of regional black experience formed by regional developments in Veracruz, influenced by those of the greater Caribbean and the Atlantic world, particularly the Haitian Revolution. And today I would like to share one last example with you all. And then we're traveling now to 1822. After over a decade of civil war in Mexico, most of Latin America, these nations were deep in revolt and formulating who belongs who in the new nation state regarding citizenship, identity, and race. And it was in this process where unfortunately in Mexico, 
officially blackness became omitted and forgotten. In 1822, four men by the name of Francisco Ruiz, Ignacio Soberón, Francisco Castro and Jose Antonio Alfaro, all retired members of the local Veracruz colonial militias who also participated in the struggles for independence were unjustly imprisoned because they refused to serve in a racially segregated militia. We have to understand by, by 1822, Mexico had a lot of racial categories. So this uh, former black militiamen were in the right to petition their freedom and they actually obtained their freedom. But nevertheless, their old colonial benefits as a black militiaman were completely eradicated under the pretext by the Mexican authorities that as one people, as Mexicans, and under the threat of Spanish aggression, their service to the fatherland will be needed once more, invalidating their colonial military retirement as well. What this case that I just shared with you shows us is that the response of the newly created Mexican state was not one that it completely failed to see them, but instead it was the state's response, one that pretended to consider the militiamen to be something that they were not as a descendants, and removed from them their value, their identity, an identity constructed, yes, through coloniality, but once that one, one identity was manipulated by a further sending militiamen. And in doing so, the state proceeded to begin erasing black presence and black identity in Veracruz, even if this black militiamen continued all the way, as we see here in this lithograph from 1828, to be the defenders of the nation and the coast, now just Mexicans, not Afro-Mexicans. To finish today, I would like to touch base on both the importance of my project and my own relationship to the project and my research real quick. All of the stories that I shared with you today are very little known, but these stories help us contest and change the ways we think about Mexico, the Atlantic world and Latin America by inserting members of the African diaspora as crucial players in the centering of these Atlantic revolutions and taking their experience away from the constraints of the colonial period, as slavery, Marunash, but as actual determinants in the modern Mexico that we know of and some of us have lived in today. But on a more personal note, and this is related to the census in 2020, the 2020 Mexican census has shown that over 2 million, 2 and a half million people in Mexico last year identified as Afro-Mexicans. And in the state of Veracruz, where I'm from, over 200,000 people identified as Afro-Mexicans. This is particularly important of the importance of family relations, and I can testify to this. And uh, I, one of the inspirations for research was my paternal great-grandmother, Amparo Mateos Casarín, was actually born in the town that I show you all of Mandinga, Veracruz. So it shows how her roots are tied to this maroon found the town, yet in my family, her blackness was always thought of foreign, never national. And what my project invites us all to rethink is to consider Afro-Mexicans as kin, as brethren of this Mexican pluricultural, pluriracial nation that I consider Mexico to be. And if we could really consider them to be part of Mexico, we can really redefine who Mexico is, what Mexico is, and who Mexicans are even to this day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan. Next, we have Sarah Brunan, who is from the Department of Sociology and with a, spe a, a specialization in inequalities in health. The title of her presentation is The Relations of Grocery Delivery Services to Food Insecure Neighborhoods, a GIS Approach to California Food Deserts. Let's welcome Sarah. Thank you so much. Okay, just one second while I share my screen. You're still not able to, to share, Sarah? No, I'm sorry. Let me check. Uh, share screen. Uh, go ahead. OK, thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much for having me. My um, project is the relation of grocery delivery services and food insecure neighborhoods. It's a GIS approach to California food deserts. Um, so I'm going to uh, define food deserts for you and talk a little bit about the problems and solutions to food deserts. And then I introduce my research question, my methods and findings, and give you a little bit of my discussion section and then uh, talk about my limitations and what I'm doing about it. So food deserts, it's a commonly used term to describe urban areas and limits with that, that have limited access to food. 
Um, it's defined by the United States Department of Agriculture, which um, includes exact approximation of spatial areas. So as you see in this map, it's like half the US, um, it's uh, the, the purplish areas. These are tracts that have a poverty rate of 20% or higher. And the pink areas are tracts um, in which 500 people or more live a mile away from a grocery store. Um, for rural areas, this definition would be 10 miles or, or further from a grocery store. Um, so this is uh, these are low income and low access uh, spatial areas and what where it matters is where these areas overlap these are your quintessential food deserts so you should recognize Southern California in these green spatial areas you see on the screen these are food deserts across this uh, Southern California region so food deserts are basically a residual of redlining practices from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, during this time, bankers, financiers, with um, sanctioned by the U.S. government, they would literally take out a map and draw up the cities, uh, draw lines around them, and rank them between um, the green areas, which were considered the best. These were the white affluent areas. Um, the yellow and blue areas were like working class or middle class whites typically, and the red areas were typically black neighborhoods or also um, Jewish neighborhoods, immigrant communities, people of color. Um, so what they would do is they would, they, they considered these to be high risk areas for providing loans and mortgages, and they would also not provide insurance. So if a grocery store wanted to operate within the boundaries of a red area, they would um, they would not be able to because they wouldn't be able to have insurance. At the same time, there was white flight happening where whites were leaving the urban areas and heading to the suburbs, and so a lot of grocery stores were following them. Um, to this day, Black neighborhoods, about only 50% of them have a supermarket. As an example of West Oakland, you saw a decrease in the number of grocery stores that went from 137 down to 22. And Safeway and Lucky were both headquartered there and they left. Um, so today we're talking about 40 million people across the U.S. Um, live in food deserts. It's about 13% of the U.S. population. It's, um, there's a lot of connections between uh, living in a food desert and health diseases like um, heart disease, cancer, malnutrition. Um, these areas have higher rates of obesity, higher rates of mortality than just a few blocks over where it's not a food desert. Um, a lot of times you'll see uh, in, an increase of fast food in these areas. They, a lot of people like to call them food swamps because they have high concentrations of uh, fast food and convenience stores and liquor stores. Um, so there's also a question of how do you report different stores? So in this picture you see it says supermarket, but it looks like a liquor store perhaps. Um, so it can kind of muddle how we define food deserts. Um, there's been a lot of uh, policies in the last um, you know, decades trying to address food deserts. Um, cities will bring in uh, policies like, uh, in one case, they brought in a program to bring uh, broccoli and kale and things like that into convenience stores to see if that would help um, the, solve the salute problem solve the problems of food deserts. There's also programs that had farmers markets or urban gardening, um, community supported agricultures where um, a household would subscribe to a particular farm and the farmers would deliver a box of produce to those that household. Um, in my paper, I go into detail about all these, about the solutions that have been uh, tried and, and why they have failed. Um, so I was thinking about maybe grocery delivery services. Um, and, and if this would be a, a way to bring healthy foods to people. Um, I don't want you to read this slide, but what I want to show you is that there's been so many studies that have demonstrated the growth of grocery delivery services in recent years. Um, this is just very much uh, parallel to all of the online shopping that's surged in popularity in recent years. Uh, so my research question is, do grocery delivery services service areas known as food deserts? And to address this, I'm doing a cross-sectional GIS analysis. I'm using primary and secondary data. And the samples, California, we're very uh, diverse here. We're, we're ranked number one in cultural diversity. We have a very large population. So it's a good sample. Um, what I'm doing actually is I'm just uh, mapping this in ArcGIS. 
So um, I've taken over 2,500 California zip codes and um, I'm literally mapping the grocery delivery service areas by looking up all the zip codes on the grocery delivery service websites to say, do they deliver here? Yes or no. And so it becomes a binaries of ones and zeros. And then I'm taking the USDA food access research atlas with their data of, of food access and overlapping those two um, maps to see uh, how they're doing. And then um, I'm also overlapping race and ethnicity demographics to see who are being overserved or underserved in these cases. Um, yeah, so I collected this data in August and September of 2020, and I had the help of seven amazing research assistants. Uh, the grocery delivery services I'm investigating, they're the, basically the five big ones in California. So Albertsons represents Albertsons, Vaughn's, Lucky, Safeway, and Pavilions. Kroger is Ralph's, Food for Less, and Food Co. Instacart, they don't operate in any one store. They they will literally deliver anything. They deliver BevMo and Sephora and, and the Texaco gas station as examples. So when I look up a zip code in Instacart, I literally just capture any of the grocery stores that um, they deliver from for that zip code. So it's basically um, throughout the state of California, it's over 80 stores. Um, Walmart retailer delivers exclusively for, for Walmart pickup and delivery, which is their grocer. And then Amazon Prime delivers exclusively from Whole Foods Market. Okay, so my findings. Uh, here you'll see a heat map that I've created. These are the grocery delivery services. Um, it's it's kind of ranked in a, in a fiery color from a lighter yellow where only one of the grocery delivery services might deliver to. And it uh, graduates down to this darker red fiery color where all five um, of the grocery delivery services will be delivering there. Um, the table here will show you that Amazon is covering about 7% of the state of California. Kroger and Walmart are about the same at around 16%. And then Instacart's like the heavy hitter. They are delivering up to about 28% of the entire state. And um, altogether, if you were to like overlap all of the grocery delivery service areas, it covers about 35% of the state of California. And so this is the USDA's food access map um, that I've, well, I've mapped it to show these are where the food deserts are in the state of California. Um, you'll see that there's uh, a lot of it is in the rural areas. However, there's a lot of little tiny food deserts all uh, throughout Southern California, up the Central Valley and into the East Bay. So what's important is where these overlap. And so in this map here, I'm showing you um, the purpley area on the West Coast is the grocery delivery services. And then you remember the rural areas here are the food deserts. And what's important is this darker area where they overlap. Um, that's, the, that's, that's the overlap. So remember I told you 34% of the food deserts are um, the state of California has food deserts. And out of those, 18% are being serviced by grocery delivery services and 81% are not being serviced. So when we look at the demographics of, of where everybody is, you see that um, Black neighborhoods, 45% of them are in food deserts. And out of those, 70% um, are not being served by the GDS. Um, Latinx communities, 23% are found in food deserts. And it's about half and half as far as GDS delivering to them or not. Um, American Indian neighborhoods, I borrowed this terminology from the census. It's American Indian, Native Alaskan, so I might change that. Um, but this, they're, they're found that 43% of, the, uh, of them are in food deserts and 86% are not being delivered to. Asian American neighborhoods are 3% uh, found in food deserts and out of those 100% are being delivered to. And then for white neighborhoods, it's 37% in food deserts and 85% are not being delivered to. And what strikes these numbers is like the Asian neighborhoods, for example, are very highly urbanized. And so that's why you're seeing the numbers at zero. Whereas um, white neighborhoods, and uh, Native American lands are a lot of times in rural areas, and that's why you're seeing these numbers as high as they are. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. Um, for fun, I created a, like a story map for you. Um, this isn't in my paper, but this is just to show you what's going on in the IE, because that's where we're, you know, Riverside's from. Um, so here, if you can find your house on the map, um, this is where the food deserts are in the Inland Empire. And um, what I'll do is I'll overlap the grocery delivery services to show you where they're delivering to in the IE. 
And as you can see, they're pretty much saturating. In fact, they're covering um, all of the food deserts. So if you are living in a food desert in the IE, you will be able to access groceries through a grocery delivery service. Not necessarily all of them, but they're there. Um, so I'll remove that and that way I can show you some of the demographics. So these are total count of, of population of people that identify as black on the US census. Um, if you notice some of the pink squares are a little bit smaller, this represents a smaller amount of people and uh, larger pink squares represent a larger total count of people that identify as black. Um, we can add in Latinx. Um, and also it's a dark blue square, squares and then the lighter blue squares are Asian communities. And then finally the white uh, communities as well. Now it's also, I'm sure you guys are aware that um, Latino is a ethnicity and so it's not mutually exclusive to the other uh, races that I've listed. So when you see like an orange with a blue, that might be um, people that are not necessarily, uh, well, it would be a, perhaps it would be a, uh, uh, people that identify as white Latinos, as an example. Um, so for my discussion, the findings suggest that the grocery delivery services are, are only, are not servicing 80% of food deserts. So the, the, it would, it would be basically the findings would say that the grocery delivery services are not solving the problems of the food deserts. Um, but I want to talk about that in a second. Um, I want to also, in my paper, I address the coronavirus because we know that during the lockdown, for example, every time you go to a grocery store, it's a uh, potential to be exposed to the coronavirus. So something like having your groceries delivered to your door would help mitigate that. And this isn't something that should be for affluent or middle class populations only. This should be for all households, um, low income populations as well. So in my paper, I address a lot of the policy implications that could address barriers to using grocery delivery services. Um, like they cost a lot of money. There's service fees, there's delivery fees, uh, there's uh, uh, alcohol fee, there's a subscription or perhaps a membership fee like Amazon Prime. And then there's gratuity on top of that. So it could be upwards of $20 um, or more possibly in fees. And then the question, do they take coupons or WIC and SNAP? And there is a 2018 farm bill that, that mandates that they um, take WIC and SNAP, however, uh, it's been really slow to roll out and it's been very problematic, especially during COVID. Um, then there's also a digital divide. Not everybody has the internet or access to um, smartphones or English, if these, that's the language used for these sites. And then also the cultural relevance of stores and dietary restrictions. So for example, if I'm eating kosher this week or my kids need uh, gluten-free products, for example, then I would wanna be able to uh, receive all types of foods to my house. Um, so the limitation that I'm working with right now, just looking at the findings, it's saying that 80% of the food deserts aren't being serviced. But um, I think that if I were to control for ur urban versus rural, that number would look much different. 95% of Californians live in urban areas. And so as you saw with the storyboard, with the, with the map of the IE, I think that there's more of a complete saturation for um, urban area. So I really want to parse that out. And this is like the first map I, I created uh, recently about where the urban areas are. So now I can go in and control for that. So it's a work in progress. Um, there's also a changing landscape of grocery delivery services. I think especially in this last year with COVID, I'm, I'm certain that these um, companies have expanded their their service areas in order to capture more of the market. And then obviously um, also as I ex expressed the, the concerns with the census data with um, uh, to say like who is actually being serviced. Uh, it's hard to parse that out when race and ethnicity are not mutually exclusive. Um, but that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and so up next, we do have uh, Sahara Furusan. She's from the anthropology uh, department and she'll be uh, presenting on cultural politics in restoration, water, and the particulate matter. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Great, thank you. Okay. 
Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sahar, and I'm going to be talking about cultural politics in restoration, water, and particulate matter um, at, um, as it pertains to salt and sea. Um, so in this presentation, um, I'll consider the cultural... Oops, let me get that going. Okay. Um, so in this presentation, I'll consider the cultural politics of water in relation to the salt and sea to situate environmental restoration projects within a history of slow violence and current actions in green capitalism. Uh, I will highlight the need to imagine alternative forms of justice beyond an environmental justice framework, which reinforces the state as a conveyor of justice. Restoration projects might offer relief symbolically and materially, but they also fo follow actions that reinforce risks and speculative, speculative futures. By cultural politics of water, I mean looking at the ways people's attitudes, beliefs, and perspectives create practices and categories of water, as well as land, um, water and land, excuse me, as well as looking at how these practices distribute water resources. Um, so the Salton Sea is California's largest inland lake. In the past four decades, it's also um, been one of California's most unloved lakes. Um, before I discuss why the Salton Sea needs restoration, I'd like to go over the beliefs and practices that led to the current construction of relationships we have at the Salton Sea today. This is because water management um, as it's been in, in the last century, um, can explain some of the practices and proposals of restoration that we are now seeing. Um, so at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the practice of reclamation was underway in the US Southwest. This was a colonial ideology of making land useful in terms of extracting from it. At this time, land prospectors in the Imperial Imper Valley um, marveled at the potential to, to cultivate the valley. Uh, the Salton Sea became a permanent feature of the landscape in 1905 when investors were attempting to control the Colorado River um, to irrigate the land. Floodwaters broke through the levees and thereby created the Salton Sea. Uh, while many people think of the Salton Sea as an accident, um, researchers are suggesting that, um, now suggesting that the flooding of the valley was a common feature of the area and what was different were the dams and levees of the Colorado River. Uh, water use in the West is dominated by the doctrine of prior appropriation, which follows a, a principle of first in use, first in rights. These first farmers in the Imperial Valley and created the Imperial Irrigation District to consolidate water, uti the, um, water utility. Um, this water district remains a senior holder of Colorado River water in Southern California. In 1922, the Colorado River Compact was formed to manage water usage in multiple states, uh, including California. California remains the majority water holder of the states of the lower Colorado Basin. Uh, the Boulder Dam and the All-American Canal infrastructure were also created at this time, intensifying agriculture uh, production in the region. Beginning in the 1920s, the Salton Sea's uh, water began to, be disdain, uh, began to be sustained by agricultural runoff uh, from Imperial Valley farms. Uh, this solved the issue of salt buildup, which would now flow into the Salton Sea. The Salton Sea uh, was officially designated a sump it, uh, by a 1928 executive order. A uh, sump is a low base, is a low space, a basin that is meant for drainage of wastewater. This marks the official incorporation of the Salton Sea into agricultural infrastructure. This is also around the time that conservationists were finding value at the Salton Sea, uh, and a wildlife refuge uh, was created at the southern end. In the 1950s, the lake uh, was a well-known recreation uh, was well known for recreational tourism, um, as well as a new residential waterfront hotspot. Capitalization on these ventures was short-lived, and in the 1960s, the ecologies of the sea the ecology of the sea began to decline due to increasing salinity, which led to wildlife die-offs die and silveric smells. Today, the development um, today the homes and developments from this time sit in ruin on the banks of the Salton Sea, though that is also changing. Um, Daniel Lawrence, in his research on environmental injustices at the Salton Sea, argues that at this time, the dominating use of the Salton Sea was for agriculture. Despite the uh, state's knowledge that this was the reason for its decline, they were unwilling to act against it. The enforcement of agriculture in the area at the expense of, envir of the environment has occurred multiple times since the 1960s, and today the role of pesticides and other contaminants in contributing to ill health is, discuss, is little discussed in restoration projects. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, as recently as 2016, has stated pesticides are not in concentration significant enough to harm human health. However, the, histor the historical record um, in other environmental justice cases 
um, has shown that the EPA's risk assess assessments are not always representative of how toxins can accumulate in bodies over time, nor are their tests representative of an entire area. Um, so turning back to the reinforcement of agriculture, Daniel Lawrence in his research argued that, the salt, that these events show that the salt and sea was, quote, not supposed to be a pristine ecological habitat, end quote. I'll add to this um, that it also shows that the salt and sea was not supposed to be a livable and safe environment for communities, but an area of, area of extraction. This is amplified in the lack of amenities and resources available to communities surrounding the salt and sea. As comprising of low-income Latinx, indigenous Mexican, and Native American populations, the people of the area have endured the continued exploitation of the land, water, and their labor, as well as the underdevelopment of their communities. This is a slow violence that has been inflicted on, on the communities in multiple forms of injustices, one of them now being the colonization of the air by particulate matter. The 1990s marked issues of, shrink of a shrinking sea related to water scarcity due to climate change and overusage of the Colorado River. The Quantitative Settlement Agreement of 2000 2003 was a negotiated collection of agreements to settle disputes over the Colorado River. This historic water transfer uh, agreement enabled California to reduce its reliance on the river and prevent water shortages in urban coastal cities by authorizing the long-term transfers of Imperial Irrigation District water from the Salton Sea to urban areas. Without this trans transfer, water shortages in coastal cities might have ushered in behavioral changes, but with it, it was business as usual. Scientists and environmentalists from San Diego opposed this transfer because it would be ec ecologically and economically detrimental to the Coachella and Imperial Valleys, as well as pose a danger to public health. The Salton Sea has no outlet, and so its use for agricultural drainage has meant that the pesticides, fertilizers, and salts have all drained into the sea for the last century until 2018 when the QSA went into full effect. Now, a significantly less amount of water flows into the sea, and the lake is evaporating and exposing particulate matter, exposing people to particulate matter with agricultural pollutants. This is a health concern for the surrounding communities whose air quality already doesn't meet federal standards are already disproportionately exposed to environmental hazards in terms of proximity to agricultural fields and already suffer from high rates of asthma and other illnesses. Studies of other dying lakes show negative effects for dust pollution even without agricultural contaminants. Due to these concerns, several dust suppression, habit, um, several dust suppression and habitat restoration projects are underway. The largest one is a 10-year plan called the Salt and Sea Management Plan. Uh, while Sorry, let me just forget what the slide was next. Um, while before the state had not invested in the Salton Sea nor supported its significance um, for wildlife, this view is, not cha um, is now changing. Historically, restoration projects had followed a belief of restoring an environment to a pristine habitat. The researchers Cantor and Nuth have argued that the Salton Sea represents a kind of post-natural restoration in terms of engineering a new landscape rather than restoring it. When the Salton Sea was first negotiated, uh, newspapers reported on the am environmental ambiguity, ambiguity of the Salton Sea, which according to Cantor and New, are enable has enabled a neoliberal push towards market schemes to fund long-term solutions. The ambiguity as to the nature of the, Salons, of the lake centers the question of what the Salton Sea should be restored to and community members, agency officials, local governments, environmentalists, and investors are all a part of the conversation. The designation of the Salton Sea as a sacrifice zone for multiple types of pollution served to sustain an agricultural empire in the desert. Now, as an environment in ruins, the Salton Sea presents a new opportunity. Um, so capitalism, um, as it operates, creates crisis and accumulates profits in the ruins of environmental and community devastation. The United States um, and the state of California and the corporate farms that have played a major role in creating environmental disaster at the sea have profited off of that through the industrial agricultural complex. Green capitalism is an economic approach that believes market-based policy instruments can resolve environmental problems. Uh, restoration, uh, restoration at the Salton Sea does the work to promote green capitalism. What uh, water markets, geothermal plants, and lithium extraction are gaining support and spurring excitement locally and nationally with the Department of Energy and the Department of National Security um, already interested in investing. 
These plans and proposals for geothermal plants and lithium extraction reframe investment in infrastructure as a solution to the receding lake, as well as to help cut down on fossil fuels. Plans like it revalue the sea as a frontier for resource uh, as a frontier for resources with a sustainable twist. Cantor and Newth describe the area as another kind of sacrifice zone, not only in terms of the numerous sources of pollution and, and underdevelopment, but also as a delicate ecological system sacrificed to green development. In, in, terms of, um, in, in terms of infrastructure for the energy sector. Environmental alterations such as these means that the state would benefit from exploiting geothermal and lithium extraction. And researchers have project, projected that allowing the Salton Sea to shrink would provide additional land for industrialization. There are benefits to these proposals. They would pay for restoration, which is a complex and costly matter. And local governments have expressed excitement in that it would bring money and jobs into communities. However, none of this is guaranteed, and researchers have noted that it leaves the region's health to be, determined, to be determined by market calculations of value. The benefits are uncertain, and the value of the solvency remains in terms of extraction. Uh, the economic proposals flying the banner of restoration have claimed a environmental justice agenda because they include community in some decision-making processes. But this inclusion hasn't altered the hierarchy of power over the land and water and has only ever been in relation to the value of the salt and sea. Money has gone into the hands of researchers, organizations, state agencies, contractors, engineers, but never directly to the communities who suffer from health issues, nor has preventative measures taken place as communities wait for restoration solutions to possibly help. Aid has never come directly to the service of the people but is diverted to environmental and engineering practices with the understanding that it will benefit the people. Despite declarations of change and a move towards environmental justice, we are far from, an evenly, we are far from evenly distributed burdens. Asthma is not just a symptom of, of exposure to particulate matter, but a consequence of how we, how we have managed waste and the environment. It's significant that many of the agencies overseeing, uh, involved in overseeing restoration are also the ones that created the issue to begin with. The movement of water from the Salton Sea to urban areas and the proposals for capitalizing on res restoring the sea are representative of a history of slow violence and settler colonialism. Understanding how people with the power to distribute resources make meaning of water and land is especially important as water in the Southwest should not be thought of as a permanent and infinite resource. California water shortages are already a reality. The Salton Sea is meaningful in multiple ways to different people throughout its history. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, it was a dry desert to be reclaimed and irrigated by white settlers. To the indigenous, indigenous nations of the region, it was a significant cultural site in the form of former Lake Cahuilla and still is in the form of the Salton Sea. For 20th century farmers, it offered rich soils for farming and a place to plant roots. For Latinx farmers, farm workers over the last century, it has been a place of work as well as a place of injustice and protest. Environment, for environmentalists, it is an important wildlife habitat for birds traveling the Pacific fly, Flyway. For farmers in the state of California, it provides drainage for an agriculture industry worth billions of dollars. Most recently, for the local economies and for the energy developers, it represents an untapped wealth in geothermal and lithium extraction. Finally, for everyone living nearest the sea and who call the place home, it is a threat to their health and a growing source of frustration with state management. Political debates and envir uh, environmental and health crises are fueling efforts to reinterpret the Salton Sea. Early developers and investors in, in the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea conceptualized water and land in terms of the dominant co colonial frameworks that followed the need to control water and make land agriculturally productive. These beliefs have turned into economic, social, and legal realities. By understanding this, we may begin to theorize restoration projects, not as a change from colonial logics, but as a continuation. Thank you, everyone. And here are my, my references. Thank you so much, Sahar. Once again, we want to thank you all for joining us here in this wonderful panels that we've had. Um, and again, we want to thank our sponsors of this conference, the Faculty Commons Working Groups at CIS. We want to make sure to thank them for bringing this conversation of graduate student work all together. Um, next, I think we'll be moving now to our question and answers. So just to remind you that you can use the chat feature um, to place comments or questions if you like to continue doing that, as well as raising your hand feature um, to ask questions for our discussion, discussion session. 
So should um, Jorge, are we ready to open up our discussion questions? Our discussion <laughs> session yes. in a long day. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. And, and uh, we can do the, re I mean, definitely the reactions uh, button works great. But also, I mean, if you turn your, your camera on and just raise your hand, you know, we'll call on you. We'll, that way we can create a queue. Also, as we know, like you can just type in your question and one of the presenters will, you know, take uh, a step at their, their answers. Anyone like to go first? Any questions? I'll, I'll get started. Uh, and that way, you know, gives folks to think, you know, to think and articulate their questions. So um, I'll start with Sahar. I mean, a really important presentation. And uh, it is something that uh, pertains to all of us. I mean, this is uh, the Salton Sea. Um, it is located, you know, like within the edges of the uh, Riverside County. and. And folks that live in the in the Coachella Valley and of course the Imperial Valley have to deal with these legacies of uh, environmental racism. So I wanted to ask you, um, and me being a historian of the late 20th century, the UFW had a big uh, activist and organizing efforts in the Coachella Valley that we still sometimes forget. Um, but thinking further, you know, from the 90s, 2000s to, to the present, what are some ground up organizing efforts that you see being uh, uh, deploy, uh, uh, come together, both the, perhaps in the Coachella Valley or also in the, within the Imperial Valley? Yeah, um, great question. I, I definitely see community demanding a spot at the table. Um, there are a lot of organizations as, as well as community members, um, you know, being very active in, in wanting to imagine the salt and sea for them and their environment as serving their community. And I even recently too, I think with all the press that the salt and sea does is, is getting with, with these projects breaking ground, um, is that people from San Diego and LA are also interested in getting involved and understanding where their water comes from and, and how it's been impacting um, people in rural areas. Um, so I think I I I def I think that um, I'm not familiar. I don't know if they have if like there's any ground up projects from the community, but I but they are they have been asking to be involved in what is going on as far as the government's um, restoration projects, and at least are um, holding their own meetings and and building their own agendas to bring it to um, officials who are, um, you know, instead of having their meetings separately they they want to come together and fix this together. Thank you. If I may go, um, I have a question for Grecia. Has there been any type of conversations between the afro oaxaqueño and Chatino and Mestiz, uh, Misteco communities in regards to envir environmental concerns. In my experience of, of doing work and collaborating with communities in Oaxaca, there's a stark difference of even amongst the communities of afro oaxaqueños and say, well, particularly the communities of Zapotecos where conversations don't happen and if not even just kind of in, in some self-regards, uh, self-separation. I was wondering if there's any kind of communications or dialogues that you have seen in your work, particularly within the Costa Chica. Thank you for asking that question. That actually is what, the, the hearing, hearing stories is actually what led me to reframe my project. Initially, I was centering and focusing on the town of Paso de la Reina and trying to articulate how was it that they created a successful movement, trying to compare that to um, communities in the North that haven't been so successful, but are also mestizo. But through that, I learned that there is like this self-separation, um, segregation, right? My first, uh, in 2015, as I was leaving an event from Paso de la Reina, the distributor who um, delivered um, basically like, the transportation is not like there's not a, a a daily car that goes out so I caught a ride with um someone that was taking supplies to a store and on my way out I asked um how are our black communities involved also with Copu Devit and his response was um that they're not and that 
tú sabes cómo son los negros. Los negros no hacen, no hacen nada. And like, in, in that moment, I just, I was, um, I started understanding that there's a lot of similarities of those things you hear in LA, growing up in Los Angeles, Um, I heard a lot of this from my own family and in family gatherings. So it's this self-segregation and also like this very well opinion of what Black people are, what Black people do. And so um, I just, you know, I wasn't sure if I was a person to do this work. And I think it took me a while. Um, so with time, I started like investigating and investigating, doing more research and, and spending more time with community with El Azufre and Charco Redondo to really learn about what are their concerns. And um, another moment has been, like, it's always me poking and asking, why aren't Black people here in this event? Or um, how are they involved? Um, but it's not really part of the narrative. So I, yeah, that's why I designed it in this way. And that's why I want to do participatory mapping in both, in all locations, not just in um, El Azufre and Charco Redondo. But um, I don't know. I, I hope that answered your question. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I That's what I was um, looking for to kind of hear some of those um, ethnographic experiences. Um, so thank you. I look forward to hearing more about your work in the future. Thank you. And yes, panelists can ask questions uh, uh, as you prepare your question. Uh, uh, Sochil has a really interesting question uh, for Sarah. So Sarah, if you would like yes, to uh, take a step at it. Thank you. Yeah, the question is about um, the use of credit cards and access to a credit card. A lot of times you need social security number in order to uh, you know, establish credit and uh, maybe undocumented immigrants don't have such uh, access to that. And so yeah, that's something I've definitely discussed in the uh, In the implications of uh, policies in the paper. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's a really important uh, point to recognize. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting um, in terms of just thinking about that in terms of um, services, especially for students, right? As um, what I've seen here within the on campus and the dorm life for especially first year students is their access and, you know, barely building themselves financially. So thinking about those two um, groups of community members. And Garcia, go ahead. Yes, I was typing it up, but I can say it. Alan, um, I have a question and I wondered if you can elaborate on this, if you've thought about it, about the like the utility of omitting black blackness or black people from the archive and how is it useful historically And today, I'm wondering if Black erasure serves other forms of inclusion for other people. Um, if you and if you've thought about that, uh, that's an excellent question, Grecia, because that's one of the things that I've been contesting the most with my own research. To what to what degree were, you know, uh, benign intentions that went wrong in a way? We also have to reframe the ideological framework. So the Mexican War of Independence as a hemispherical framework. I'm here thinking about Bolivar's question about like, you know, a Latin American United Nation, but yet he very much detested black politics to the extent of Haiti at the same time, right? So I think one of the reasons by which this conceptualization of Mexican being a racialist term and citizenship replacing the racial is the, the first one is that racial terms under the, they were tightly uh, constructed in, commonality to Spanish colonialism. And if the purpose of the pro-political project was to become independent from Spanish colonialism, then clearly so it was to the delete and go away with those racial categories, right? So that's kind of like the first one, but also at the same time, we also have to really consider those uh, social race, what, what they were called in some historic works of historiography as of late, uh, social racial subalterns, right? I'm here thinking about Vicente Guerrero, the first and only uh, fully acknowledged Afro-Mexican president, right? And if you look at his story and the way that he was betrayed by 1831, he was assassinated, right? It also shows how within this criollo or Creole framework of Spanish descendant Mexicans that took power at the time of independence, right? It's also this mestizaje and this like, kind of like not whitening, but the racializing of the state and society served a purpose, right? A purpose for justification of a new generation of Spanish descendants to take over while more uh, in indigeneity and blackness rooted politics were sidelined, right? 
And I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, with, this. You've seen this with your work that is more modern, right? How like indigenous communities or Afro Mexican communities are completely sidelined from mainstream political projects. And this was certainly the case in, in Veracruz. And what I found in my research is that it is in this transition from 1821 to 1826 where these peoples are helping contest and reframe Mexico as a modern nation. Yet their blackness gets extirpated, and whatever benefits based on race they thrived on or were able actually to manipulate for a benefit from the colonial state, that ability is not there. And then they lack to manipulate that ability, then their protagonism as political intellectual actors gets taken away. And the other blackness as political that is thought of by these like framers of the state would be radical, right? Against whites or against Spanish descendants or European descendants as in Haiti, for example, right? So it's it's a tricky thing that I don't want to say that it serves a, a, a completely negative purpose. But again, it's it's a very complicated, it's also the nature of the sources, right? A lot of the sources are not outright saying, you know, we're doing this because of that. It's it's kind of like they're going also experimenting, going on with the flow for lack of a better word in, in terms of defining who the nation and who Mexicans are, right? But what I argue is that it was in this moment where invisibility and neglect have for 200 years led us to the point where we're now where you see an Afro-Mexican on the street in Mexico City and they start be getting questioned by Instituto Nacional de Inmigración, either Mexican or Honduran or Garifuna, et cetera, right? And they can be from Mandinga, Veracruz. They can be from Costa Chica, right? But yeah, the, the notion of blackness, I think it's uh, not Mexican is rooted in this transition from colony to, to nation. Thank you so much for your responses. Are there any questions from the audience? Can I ask a question? Sure, Gabriela, go ahead. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, this question is for uh, Sahar. Um, great presentation, uh, Sahar and everybody. Um, I'm wondering how the concept of um, or how the status of, un of being unincorporated, particularly like the Eastern Coachella Valley communities, how that appears in your in your work, um, specifically as you're as you're um, applying the concept of slow violence. Um, great question. I um, I think that in terms of his, like the history of it, it has meant that those areas don't have um domain over their land and to be able to appeal to their um, um cities governments and it has um perpetuated slow violence where if they're unincorporated the farm the landowners are the majority of the farm farmers who don't live in the area and live in you know places like la quinta and, and around um, and they've been able to dictate what happens in the San Sea region and in terms of development and, and investment and, and fight for where they want the water to go and how much. Um, yeah, so I, and it's that's a great question for us in terms of what's happening now with the restoration projects. I'm not, um, that would be a good thing for me to kind of consider because um, restoration right now I, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how that would, being unincorporated, um, in terms too of it, it's restorations is really, really costly um, endeavor at the Salt and Sea. And, and um, so, you know, they, they need the help of big monies to, to do the restoration project. So yeah, great question. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. I, uh, if there are questions, other questions, definitely type them in the chat. Meanwhile, I just wanted to invite you to uh, uh, that the next panel is coming up in uh, 11 minutes now. Uh, Gabriela, <laughs> you'll be presenting uh, along um, uh, Jess uh, Jessica Gutierrez Massini, uh, Joshua Lianchenko, and uh, Melissa Mayon, who uh, was in, has been here in and out. So with that, I think I, I um, I'm sure that you can uh, look at the amazing work of the panels and contact them directly. So really thankful that you were all here for us, uh, you know, for them and, and, and in this conversation. So actually anything else that we should add? 
No, just once again, thank you all for spending your Wednesday here with us. And also, I want to thank um, Dr. Ar um, Ivan Aguirre and Dr. Adrian Felix for offering their in, um, interpretation possibilities as well. So it's a lot of um, in-kind work that all of us are doing. So I just want to thank our colleagues who have been part of it and as well as the organizers of CIS. And so we want to just wish you all a very safe and sound um, end of the school year and summer. So please take care of yourself and your communities. And thank you to all of our other colleagues that are here um, with various faculty commons groups um, joining us to support our graduate students. Great presentations and such in here, uh, you know, like high five. You yes, know, high five, <laughs> colega. <laughs> <laughs> see you in the next panel, everyone. Yes, great to see you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.